We come now to a very important discussion. It is session 14 about forgiveness. Rest, forgiving as God has forgiven you. We find this verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That is a tall order for Christians, to forgive as God has forgiven them. Yet it is the very words of the Apostle Paul under the authority of the Holy Spirit that we are to forgive according to the example of God Almighty, according to the one who is perfect, who has never sinned, we are to forgive like him. And of course, we have sinned. Every one of us, last one of us has sinned. Here's a very important statement about forgiveness as we take rest from our inner world to the world. Forgiveness is a premeditated condition of the heart based on the fact that God in Christ has already forgiven you. Every last one of us is going to be sinned against by someone else. Because just like ourselves, the other people, the people in our families, our parents, our children, our spouses, husband or wife, our fellow workers, staff members in a church, people who work in a company, business together. Out on the streets, the other, the other drivers, they too are sinners, and they might sin against you by cutting in front of you or beeping their horns behind you, agitating you. Someone may trip you accidentally or intentionally. Each of us right now is thinking of someone that has done, done some injury to us, perhaps the betrayal, being a friend for a time and then taking advantage of us or speaking against us, gossiping against us. The list goes on. We are to forgive as God in Christ has forgiven us. That's a tall order. The success of our forgiveness and offering forgiveness is largely dependent on us thinking ahead of time of how we have been forgiven by God. It's a premeditated condition absorbing the truth that God has forgiven us as sinners. And therefore, we are to turn around and offer the same to those sinners who sin against us. And this is a time of private premeditation that we need to go through, each last one of us, and ponder not so much on how we've been offended against how others have hurt us, but to ponder the fact that we have hurt God. We have crucified Christ, the means of our forgiveness. And to let that soak into our beings for those who have realized, come to grip with the fact that they have been forgiven are most often those who will release others forgiving them. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. How does God forgive? Let's break this down and look at it closely. Forgiving as God forgives means you, the offended, take the initiative. Right now, I am emailing a person who, that is convinced they've been attacked by another. And uh, they think the offender ought to come to them and apologize. Now, sometimes the offender doesn't even know what he or she has done to a friend or to the other person. They don't even know what they have done. Perhaps it was incidental and accidental. Perhaps their motives have been judged as impure when they really are pure. And they may have forgotten the incident, not knowing that they have hurt someone. So if you don't go to them, how are they going to know? How can they come and confess to you if they don't realize it? But even if they do know, we are to take the initiative, make the first steps. We are to forgive in our hearts in a premeditated fashion. 
You, the offended, take the initiative, because that's what God did. Let's look at biblical history. Let's go way back to the first sin. God came to Adam and Eve, but the Lord God called to man. This is after they have sinned, eaten of the fruit that they were forbidden to eat from. Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he here is Adam. Who told you, God says, that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So there we have this conversation between God, the perfect, and Adam, now who is a sinner, very imperfect. It is the Lord that calls out to the man, Where are you? Adam, hello. And he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Um, Adam, who told you you were naked? You see, without sin, there was, there was no awareness of that, of their nakedness. There was no shame, which often comes because of sin. Who told you that you were naked, Adam? And God goes right to the point, to the heart of the matter. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? There's the question. And of course he had. But God took the initiative. We look further down in the chapter, just a few verses away from this text. And we read, and I will put, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, this is a conversation not about Adam now, but it's a conversation with Satan that God is having. And a seed would come, as we fill in the rest of the verses, a seed who would be a descendant to come later on, and it's really a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And there'd be, he would come, an offspring, and he will crush your head, Satan, though you will strike his heel. You'll give him some pain while he's on earth, all right, but he will crush your head. In other words, God was already taking the initiative to save mankind. Right away in the book of Genesis, it is foretold that God went to his plan of salvation. Immediately mentioned, God took the initiative to find Adam and Eve in the garden. He didn't wait for them well, when you're sick and tired of your sin and you sit in there and stew a while and when you feel miserable enough, maybe you'll come to me and we'll talk about this. That was not his posture. God rather stepped forth, took the initiative to come to man. And he could have said, well, man, you've got yourself into this fix. You get yourself out. You figure a way out to get rid of your sin. Work off, try working it off for a while. But uh, I'm just going to wait until you come to me with a plan. No, God gave hints immediately of a plan to save man. Remember the words, forgive as you have been forgiven by God through Christ. You take the initiative if you are going to forgive others. Do it in the pattern of God. He, the one who sinned against, goes to the sinner who has sinned against him. Very important. He took the initiative. This man who's emailing me is expecting this other person because supposedly they're more spiritual, that they ought to know that they have offended. They ought to know that they have offended me. I'm waiting for him month after month and he doesn't come to me. What are you going to do about it? Looking to me. Well, I told him, you have to go to him taking the initiative. I will not. I will not. And that's often the posture of individuals. I will not go to them. I will not do that. I will not talk further with him until he does. I've got one path for you to go down, and that's you take the initiative to go to the one who you believe has sinned against you. It's Matthew chapter 18. Well, God took the initiative in the garden. And notice well, that God took the initiative, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
You didn't wait till we made ourselves better. The human race got worse and worse, even though they had uh, revelation and they had uh, chapters and books of the Bible and the Old Testament. The human race has not gotten better on its own. So God takes the initiative. And while we were sinners, God came to us. God brought his son. And he then spoke to us through his son and through the death of his son. How has God forgiven us in Christ Jesus? He took the initiative, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And I can't uh, exactly explain to you how God foreknew and he, how he chose us ahead of time. But again, it's a form of God taking the initiative right from the beginning and even before the creation of the world. He took the initiative for giving us. How did God do this? He took the initiative. Christ died to forgive us. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. God take, took the initiative of forgiving us. He forgave us all our sins having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He gave it away, nailing it to the cross. He took the initiative, Colossians chapter 2. Christ forgave us before we even thought of asking. There in the throne of death, carrying the cross, before the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lot blaspheming his name, putting thorns upon his brow, scourging him until he was almost dead with the blood flowing from him. Yet Christ said, forgive them, forgive them. He took the initiative in the worst of agony that's ever been experienced by any human being. Do you understand how, uh, and do you understand and do you appreciate how God in Christ has forgiven you? Do you know how he's forgiven you? Do you appreciate it? Have you meditated upon it until it's in every corpuscle of your being, every soul of your part, uh, of your being, of your flesh and blood and your mind? Have you soaked in the forgiveness of God and what Christ went through? If you have, that is the preparation for forgiving others. Every time you're wounded, harmed, hurt intentionally or otherwise, remember how Christ was wounded. In every way, in every form of suffering, Christ suffered. We can never say God doesn't understand because he doesn't know this suffering. Ah, Christ suffered it all, and even the father watching his son suffer would be the greatest of pains for the father. Have you thought about it till, till it's deeply in your soul and heart? He took the initiative forgiving us as we pounded nails into his flesh. Let me just stop there to tell a bit about myself. At age 12, I became a believer in Jesus Christ, but I hadn't given myself totally over to him. I was then in college and I wondered what my what life would amount to. And uh, one day, you know, I was so despondent, so discouraged, not knowing what to do with my life, and I realized as I was told again and again, do something for God, I realized I had nothing to give God, no great talent, no great abilities to give him. And I sobbed and I wept and I was in my car and I pounded the steering wheel in agony and feeling terrible. And then I realized for the first time what a sinner I was. Now, I wasn't one who was street smart. I hadn't done anything illegal in my life. Everybody on the outside would say I was a very nice young man. But inside I realized I was critical and cruel in my mind against other people. I was very proud, so proud that I wouldn't speak. I was afraid of being wrong in some way. And uh, there was a verse I found in the Bible that my pride encompasses me like a chain. Pride kept me very quiet and still. I appeared to be humble, but I wasn't. And I finally realized what Christ had done for me and the death on the cross, that was for me. I mean, it, 
it gripped me to an extent I'd never experienced before, and I sobbed all the more to think that he the perfect died for me the imperfect. I felt like Peter felt after uh, Jesus had outfished him and, and had the great number of fish in his boat after they had fished all night, he said, throw the nets on the other side, and it took two boats to take it all in. And Peter's response was, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. And I felt that way, get away from me. You are so good, I've, this bright light of your holy presence is too much for me to bear. But I had to succumb and I had to say, okay, take my life and do what you will. Do what you want with it. I can't make anything of my life. Your forgiveness is so great. I actually can't bear it. Well, that was a changing point in my life. I said, I'll just take me and do any little thing or whatever you want with me. Do nothing with me if you want, but I'm yours. Here I am. Well, the experience of that forgiveness caused me to see other people in a different light. Uh, prejudice, looking down at people that did things I didn't approve of, those kinds of things, and, and so forth. And the next morning I went back to college and I was driving along and the telephone poles looked like crosses and I began to sing, the cross before me, the world behind me. Well, this was a point in time when God came to me showing me how he had forgiven me. And it has been easier, not always easy, but easier to forgive people from that point on. And that was the premeditated moment, a moment that I have to return to again and again. But uh, the change came as I realized that he had taken the initiative, pursuing and chasing me, the God of heaven. It's only his love that allows us to forgive others as we've been forgiven. He died in order to forgive us. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Have you received God's forgiveness in Christ Jesus? That's the question. If you have, forgive as forgiven. Forgiving as God forgives means you, the offended, take the initiative. You, the offended, take the initiative. Forgiving as God forgives means, secondly, that you bear the consequences of their sins. This sounds really difficult, but you bear the consequences of their sins. Forgiving means, it doesn't mean that you don't have any problems or difficulties or wounds. Let's, for instance, understand that, well, here's an illustration. Very simply, suppose you're driving and a man under the influence of alcohol is driving and he hits you as a pedestrian. You've been walking across the street legally and you are hit and you're tossed into the ditch. He drives off just the same. You don't see him again. How are you to forgive the consequence of that person's ill or wrong and carelessness that harms you. You deal perhaps with a broken leg. Maybe the leg is never the same. Maybe you're an athlete, a soccer player, a football player, and you can't play as you used to play. You limp. Later in life, you get arthritis in that leg of yours as it hurts. And uh, it's it just not straightened and you need surgery again later in life. Such agony that has happened to you because someone drove by, hit you, and ran off. And you'll never get to see that person. You can be very bitter at heart, harden your heart against this person because they have caused this consequence against you. But why? Why harden your heart when your leg has simply been broken? Well, there's no simple about it. It's painful. It's difficult. It's harsh. It's a consequence. But you've decided that you will let God deal with this person and you'll accept their sins against you and live the best you can with this injury that has changed the direction of your life and limited your capacity for enjoyment athletically and you bear that pain every day to some extent. Well, there are worse examples of that. 
where children are taken, a parent is taken, and, and it's very hard. But if you become bitter at heart, life is only worse for you. So you agree that there may be consequences that happen to you. Someone lies about you and you don't get the promotion at the workplace. Someone else despises you, maybe divorces you, maybe cheats on you, whatever it is. Forgiveness is grace in action. Paying someone's debt as in canceling a debt that is owed to you. It's paid. It's done with. I will not add to the payment. And of course, God will handle it, ultimately. We find an example like that of our Lord of forgiveness. Who has offended you? Forgiving as Christ in God forgave you means that you, the offended, take the initiative as you suffer the consequence of their sin. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Your readiness to forgive is essential for a life of love and ministry. Yesterday I read from Walter A. Hendrickson's book, Thoughts from the Diary of a Desperate Man. I read again, he says, if you cannot forgive because of hurt inflicted by others, you will be unwilling to be vulnerable for fear of being hurt again. Because people are sinners, you cannot love and you cannot minister without getting hurt. If you are in any form of ministry, be it professional as a pastor, a missionary, or you're a layman in a church, whoever you are at any level. If you get involved with people, you better be ready to forgive them. Many church staff, uh, pastors, uh, well, put it this way, one of the biggest problems in churches is pastors getting along. I hate to say it. But staff working together, they have to work hard at accepting one another, their differences working together uh, well, and, and they must be ready to forgive one another, offenses that may be intentional or unintentional. If you're going to work together in a church, be ready to forgive. If you're going to be a minister, a pastor, you're going to have parishioners that may say things that are harmful, that hurt you individually. And likewise, you may have a pastor who speaks very sharply and is not tender with the sheep always and you don't like that you probably have to forgive your pastor because he too is human he has limitations you can't begin to minister apart from having to forgive someone along the way i'll tell you if you continue to hold burdens against people even when they have afflicted you intentionally you will not make it long in ministry if you hold a grudge and fail to forgive them, let go of it. We've already talked about releasing. Releasing those who have offended you. Let God deal with them. Eventually, it will catch up with them. Forgiveness God's way means that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. That you bear the consequences of their sin. He himself bore our sins, Christ in his body, on the tree, on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Sometimes Christians extend that grace of healing and forgiveness to others. That we are the body of Christ, and he takes his body and allows it to suffer at the hands of evildoers. There are many who are being persecuted in countries all around the world, but it's often those who watch the persecuted and how they respond, and that leads them to Christ. May I tell you a story about uh, believers in Africa? There was a reunion of a church that had been planted many years before, but when the first missionaries got there and the natives heard again and again their message about forgiveness and eternal life and not being afraid of death, the natives didn't know how to measure, didn't know how to measure 
whether these people really believed in what they were saying about eternal life, life and going to heaven and looking forward to being with God once they died. So they devised a plan. They quietly began to poison the missionaries. And there'd be a child from this family that would get ill and die. And they watched the family and how it responded. And there'd be a missionary, a wife, a woman, a mother. They would poison. And she would die. And they watched how the missionary family responded. And yet another in this group. And the point of all this was it was a church that had been planted a hundred years earlier. And it was there. It was thriving. It was adding. People were being saved continually year after year. Why? Because ill was done and God's people suffered. Suffered horrendously, terribly. The death of loved ones. But it was in their forgiving hearts and how they responded to what was going on. They did not become bitter. That was the key that showed the natives, the tribe members, that they, yes, believed, the missionaries believed in eternal life. And God may choose to have you suffer. And by that suffering, others may come to him. And you have extended, you are an extension of the body of Christ as the church. And we may endure great hardships. And so enduring, that is the message, the literal message that we believe in Jesus Christ. Tall orders. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Unforgiveness is like holding the devil by the hand. I've already spoken of this verse, and let me just repeat once again, that if we fail to forgive, there is a nest or a beach head allowing Satan to take foothold in our lives. He doesn't possess the believer, but he sure can have influence over the believer. And he begins to target your heart, your life, making you bitter, making you very miserable, and keeping you off balance and ineffective in your faith and your witness to others because you're consumed with this bitterness. And then it can extend to many others. Unforgiveness if infects others. Hebrews chapter 12, 14 through 15 says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and be holy. Without holiness, no one can see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up and cause problem and what? And defiles many. That bitterness can be heard in the speech. A person becomes bitter toward many people, talking evil against others, has no joy in their life, passing it on to others, causing trouble in churches because they wouldn't forgive, gossiping, telling little lies, acting as a little messenger of Satan because Satan has made a beachhead in their life they wouldn't forgive. And now Satan uses them in the church. I'm afraid all too often the root of church problems is the lack of forgiveness in the believer's life. They have not learned to forgive as God in Christ has forgiven. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. But what if they do it again? Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times, Jesus answered. I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Uh, many times over. Keep forgiving, in other words, whether the number is 77 or 7 or 707 or an infinite number of times, be ready to forgive again and again and again. There's a little guy named Landon, and this goes way back. 
by way of illustration, when our youngest son was probably uh, five or six years old. And we were at a baseball game. We were playing softball, actually, and it was at the end of the game, and it was beginning to rain, and so we were hurrying up to get the baseballs, the gloves, and the bats in the cars to leave. Well, our, our son swung a bat around carelessly, as a six-year-old might do, watching others play. He wanted to swing the bat, so he swings it, and there's this little guy named Landon, who's four years old, and he caught the bat right in the head. He was screaming and crying, and blood was running down his face. He was cut above his eye, and it, it was awful and terrible. And uh, so we took our Nathan after the blood was, you know, wiped away and all, and the tears had subsided some. And uh, we said to our Nathan, now you need to apologize and ask forgiveness from Landon. So Nathan goes over to Landon, frightened and scared, and he says, Landon, will you forgiving, forgive me for hitting you with the baseball bat? And Landon says, I'd forgive you even if you did it again. And that's the attitude from a four-year-old that we ought to take. I'd forgive you even if you did it again. We need to learn from children at times. Here we have Matthew 18 telling us how to forgive. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I cancel all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you go and have mercy, had had mercy on the fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned to him, turned him over to the jailers to be tormented until he should pay back all he owned. This is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you have forgiven, unless you forgive your brother from deep within your heart. You get the picture. Unforgiveness is one of the worst sins among us. It really is. It goes on undetected, unaddressed. And so this is part of bringing that peace with God you have as a forgiven individual into the world that is cruel in one way or another to every person. If you're married, you're going to have to learn to forgive. I shared this little saying before, bitterness is like an acid which, acid which destroys the vessel in which it is stored more than the vessel on which it is poured. The storing of this bitterness in you destroys you before it destroys the person you'd like to pour it on. Forgiveness is about forgiving the sinners. So you are not bound by the sin of unforgiveness and its bitter effects. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Forgiveness God's way. What other way is there? I want to lead you in prayer in the event that someone has come to mind that you have not forgiven. A mother, a father, a sister, a brother, a child, a husband, a wife, an ex-husband or wife, someone in the church, someone in the world, in the marketplace, who is it that you haven't forgiven from your heart? You taking the initiative. Let's pray. Lord, I pray as this message has gone out upon the face of the earth, that every person out there who is not forgiven would right now from the heart forgive those individuals whether they ever see them again or not, but they would resolve in their heart to forgive as you have forgiven us in Christ Jesus. That they would release, knowing that you are the one who has great ability to punish, be it in hell or to discipline your saints, your believers. You can do it much better, precisely. So we leave that job to you of correcting others, that we ourselves from our hearts forgive those who have injured us in one way or the other. 
And in the same breath, if we realize that we have harmed someone, that we would do as Matthew 18 says, we would go to those individuals and ask our forgiveness and be there. And if we're one that has come to, we might have the attitude of little Landon and say, I would forgive you even if you did it again. Thank you for your perfection in forgiveness, forgiving us while we were yet sinners as you came and you died for us. Praise be unto God Almighty. In Jesus' name, amen. This session has ended.